we're starting uh, a new series this week on prayer. And uh, like uh, Ingrid said, uh, there's the book available, and, and uh, it's, a, it's amazing. But as we start this morning, I wonder if when each of us, our relationship with prayer is like today, and what kind of relationship we have. If I were to do maybe the unthinkable and say, let's grab a mic and have each one of us pray into the mic this morning. Uh, there's some of you, your heart rate is going up with just the thought of that, isn't it? You know, like, you want me to pray in front of people, into a microphone, where's the nearest exit? You're out. And it's not because you don't want to pray, but the idea of praying in front of people and being exposed like that um, may be too much for you to handle. We all have our own unique relationships with prayer. But let's just slow our heart rates back down. I'm not going to ask you to pray or anything like that. And just think for a second. Were you taught to pray? How so? By whom? Was it instruction? Was it repetition? Did it leaving you want to pray more or less? We all have our relationship and journey with prayer. And if when reflecting on those questions, you don't sit there feeling confident, we hope that this series will be of immense help to you. Uh, But again, nothing that we'll say during this series will change your prayer life. Only you can do that. That being said, today, 29% of Canadians are are praying daily. Most pray with thanksgiving or a desire for God or, or as they worship God, they want God to do something in their lives. But 29% of Canadians pray daily to various faith systems in various faith systems. All over the world, no matter the religion, billions of people will pray today. Even the most ardent atheist, when in desperate need of help, may utter just a whispered prayer, if there is a God out there, would you please save my child or my marriage or my business? It seems that we're wired for prayer. We're wired for connection with something way beyond us. And while we may not always remember the exact words at the time, Dr. William Barclay pointed out that Jesus died with a prayer on his lips. And so for Jesus, prayer was both a practice and presence. But it was more about the presence of being with his Father. Now, we're going to be using, like Pastor Ingrid said, uh, for this series, we're going to be using as a guide Pete Gregg, who, uh, following the Lord's Prayer, wrote a beautiful book called How to Pray, A Simple Guide for Normal People. He also introduced a couple of courses on prayer that you can find at prayercourses.org. There's a number of exercises and things you can do there, but the first course there is praying the Lord's Prayer, and the second one is unanswered prayer, how to walk through when God doesn't seem to be answering your prayers. So they're both excellent things for you to potentially look at. Now, in both Matthew and Luke is where we find Jesus uh, talks about prayer, teaching in the Sermon on the Mount and to his disciples. In Matthew 6, 5 and 6, we hear this. Whenever you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites because they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by people. Truly, I tell you, they have the reward. But when you pray, go into your private room, shut your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father, who is in secret, will reward you. In Luke 11, 1, we read this. He was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John has taught his disciples. Now, as I opened, 29% of Canadians today will pray. But what about the rest? What about the 71%? Now, before we learn to pray, I propose the top two issues affecting the 71% of Canadians who won't pray on a daily basis is this, distraction or performance. 
And whatever their context, they are potentially like Martha when Jesus visited her, their home. And this is found in Luke 10, if you wanted to look it up. She was too busy and distracted by the details of making everything just right, too worried about her performance as host to realize that like her sister Mary, pausing and sitting at the feet of Jesus was the best place to be in the presence of God. And Jesus' own disciples saw that his prayer time was so empowering to him they knew it was key for them. Like I said in Luke eleven twelve, 12, he was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. And what's how he doesn't say, teach us how to pray, but teach us to actually pray, to make this a part of our everyday living. If you don't wish to learn to pray, then there's nothing I can do for you. But if you wish to learn how to pray before actually doing any praying like Martha or like the disciples watching Jesus, you may need to adjust your posture. Pete Gregg in his book says it like this. In prayer, to start, we must stop. To move forward, we must pause. Sit quietly. Stillness and silence Prepare your mind and prime your heart to pray from a place of greater peace, faith, and adoration. See, when you learn to pause, you will start to pray. I have a question for you. How many of you here, and it's rhetorical, you don't have to put up your hand. How many of you here say grace or a prayer before eating a meal? Have you ever stopped to think why this rhythm is powerful and repeated in your daily life? And if you do, it's because you do three identical things that Jesus taught, taught us. You pause, you pray in a certain place. And this is what makes it so sticky in your life, what makes it happen again and again and become a habit for you. For Jesus, this was his constant practice in life, to find a place to pause and pray. It consistently marks his ministry times. I'm going to list a whole bunch here for you to see that this was a regular practice. And most of them are chronological going through his life here. Mark 1, 12, Jesus goes to the desert to pray before his ministry began. And it's when he was tested. Following this, he chooses his disciples Mark 1.35, very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Luke 5.15 and 16 and Mark 1.45, Jesus, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. You can find it again in Matthew 4.13, Mark 6.31-32, Matthew 14.23, Mark 6.46, Luke 9.18, Mark 8.27. I think you're getting the point. Luke 22.39, this was Jesus' usual place to pray when he was in Jerusalem. Mark 9.2, Mark 14.32, Matthew 15.29, and Luke 11.1. Jesus made it a regular practice to pause and pray in a certain place. Now, for Jesus, a certain place would have to be a, a type of place. Because as he was, as the Bible says, the son of man, or as he said, the son of man with no place to lay his head. He was constantly moving from one city to the next, often uh, you know, needing the generosity of others for a place to stay or staying out in the open. But going back to say, going back to when we were saying about a blessing or a grace before a meal, what do you do at a mealtime? You have a specific place that you eat. You have a specific place then to pause and pray. So what might you need to develop a deeper life of prayer? I first suggest that we find a specific place and to pause, to posture your heart to pray. And regarding prayer, this is actually the first thing, like I said earlier, that Jesus taught. But when you pray, go into your private room and shut your door 
and pray to your Father who is in secret, or as in some translations say, who is in the secret place. Notice what Jesus doesn't say there. If you pray, or you must pray this length of time in order for it to be effective, or you have to pray in this particular prayer posture in order for God to hear you. There's nothing specific he's saying about how you must pray. His entire teaching on how to pray in the original language is only 31 words. But it all starts with you pausing in a certain place to pray. Pausing and finding that secret place for you and God to meet. And what makes this step so powerful? The simple act of finding a place to pray is in itself an act of prayer. Your intention to focus on God rather than distractions. Just starting that by saying, I'm going to the place where God and I meet is already the first step in you praying. The ancient Celtic Christians, they used to call these special places of of prayer where God seems to be so close, they called them thin places where the space between heaven and earth just seemed thinner and it seemed more tangible to be in God's presence. Maybe you've experienced that. Maybe you have a place where it just seems easier to connect with God. The location seems to matter. See, the disciples, where were they? But in the upper room, a secret place, when on the day of Pentecost, had arrived, they were all gathered together in one place. And suddenly a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were staying. They saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each of them. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Isn't it interesting that God filled the place first and then filled them. Sometimes we can have that place where God's presence just seems so tangible that when we step into that moment, we just have that precious time with him. So where's your thin place? What might become your thin space? If you desire power and prayer, this week I encourage you to discover a specific place to pause, pray. It can be a chair or a couch. It doesn't have to be anything really overly, you know, like set apart about this place or really, you know, unique or anything. It can be a comfy place. It can be a walk with the dog. It can be parked in your driveway or on your drive to work. It can be early in the morning at lunch or just before you go to bed. None of those specifics really matter. See, Jesus also knew the power of a place when it came to prayer. On his way to the cross, he found a place to pray, an olive grove called Gethsemane. And in this specific place of prayer, which was, like I mentioned, his usual place of prayer in Jerusalem, Jesus is pressed. But what flows out is as pure then as it is today. Olives. He was in an olive garden. Olive oil is made when the olive itself is rest. It's crushed beyond measure. And when this happens, what is inside comes out. Life center, loved ones, family. In a season of pressing all around us, imagine instead of bitterness from prayer, blessing would flow. Instead of criticism from prayer, compassion would flow. Instead of suspicion from prayer, Surrender to the Father would flow. If you don't like what's flowing out of you right now, find a specific place to pause and pray. And by finding a specific place to pray, you deal a death blow to distraction. As we close this morning, I want to leave you with this quote from Pete Griggs' book. 2,000 years ago, The disciples welcomed Jesus back from his regular time of prayer with one of the greatest petitions of all time. Lord, one of them said, teach us to pray. 
And his response to that simple, humble request was astonishingly generous. He didn't make the disciples feel small. He didn't say, you really ought to know by now. Instead, he gave them the greatest prayer in world history. These men would go on to have extraordinary prayer lives. They would intercede until buildings shook. They would spring Peter from a high-security jail by the power of their prayer. Their very shadows and handkerchiefs would sometimes heal the sick. They would receive the kinds of revelations that change cultural paradigms. And most remarkably of all, they would all one day find the grace within themselves to pray for their torturers at the very point of death. Now, you may be thinking, I'm not one of those disciples. Yes, yes, you are. Lori, yes, yes, you are. Nick is here because of the power of a praying mom. Prayer is effective when you find your space. If you're here this morning and you have loved ones that don't know Jesus, if you're struggling, I tell you, the power of prayer can change more than any human effort could. Find your place to pray. Find that quiet, secluded place place, so you won't be tempted to role play before God. There's nobody there to see you look all holy. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can imagine. And focus, that focus you have will shift you from you and everything about you to focusing on God and who he is in those situations. And you will begin to sense God's grace. Pause, find your place, and pray. Next week, we'll dig deeper into what it looks like, what to say in those moments. But let's pray now. God, in your word, it says, be still and know that I am God. God, in in a world that moves faster and faster day by day, the idea of pausing, slowing down to pray seems backwards. But in reality, it is the only thing that moves us closer to you. So may we be still before you so the distractions of this world would go strangely dim in the light of your glory. God, we thank you that you cherish those moments of prayer way more than we do. That you sit there excitedly waiting for us to come and talk with you. And I pray for all here that they would find a space where the air seems thin and they seem so close to heaven and so close to you. And that those places would be places they would love to spend more and more time in with you. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.